Okay. Very good. I'm not sure if you can see me. I cannot. I'm going to promote you to the panelists if you could accept it. Okay. All right, there we go. I think that that works. Madam Clerk, are we all set now? Yes. All right, very good. Good afternoon. Would like to call the May 5th meeting of the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee for the City of Plantation to order. Would our clerk please call the roll? Cordova? Present. Seraphine? Mr. Mr. Levin, Levant, Levantin, Levington, Mr. Levington. Yes, I'm here. Ms. Bruce. Here. Ms. Edwards. Here. Mr. Arbach. Mayor Stoner. Here. Ms. Achos. Here. Ms. Rivera. Here. Madam Clerk, do we have a quorum this afternoon? Yes, we do. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to apologize uh, in advance. At the beginning of the meeting, I got a call around 3.50 that my two and a half year old who's sitting here on my lap was running a bit of a fever. So like a working mom had to go and pick up Buzz from school. So he is uh, also joining our meeting this afternoon. And um, that's why I'm not there in person. But I wanted to thank everyone for uh, coming to the meeting today. Uh, Madam Clerk, we will entertain a motion from one of the members to um, approve the April 7th meetings uh, minutes as emailed. Do we have a motion? So moved. Thank you. Mr. Leviton has moved the acceptance of the minutes. Do we have a second? Mayor Stoner made the motion. Mr. Leventon made the second. Um, I apologize. I could not hear. No problem. Thank you. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. We'll show the motion to accept approval of the minutes as presented. Uh, before we get into the new business, we do have a new member. Would like to introduce uh, Dan Leviton. I hope I'm saying your last name correctly. Uh, we'll turn the floor over to you so you can tell us a bit about yourself and your background and uh, involvement or role with affordable housing. Well, thank you. Um, I don't know if you want to turn my camera on as an attendee or not, but uh, I've been in the housing business uh, since 1968. I was a builder and developer in Chicago, have built Section 8 to 21D3, have built uh... Dan, if you can unmute. Did we lose Mr. Leviton? We did. Goodness, okay, well, let's, we'll give him a moment to uh, hopefully rejoin our meeting. While he is doing that, I see we also, uh, besides Mayor Stoner in attendance, we have um, Councilman Nick Sordle joining remotely. And I can't see, but I'm going to imagine as Councilman Fadgen in the audience, he usually attends all of our meetings in person. All right, very good. Mr. Leviton, are you back with us? If you can unmute, I'll return the floor to you so you can continue. You may have to unmute. Try and do, go. there we go. There you go. All right, now I've got to turn my camera on again and we're all set. Here I am again. 
thank you. Sorry for the technical issues. Um, I've been in the housing industry since 1968, have built uh, a number of uh, low and moderate income housing developments around the Midwest and uh, moved to Florida in the 1980s, became a consultant to the housing industry, and I'm still involved in development of a number of different types of housing around the country. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for your time and commitment and, uh, and joining us. We're glad to have you on the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Broward County Commissioner, and former state senator, Senator Nan Rich is uh, joining us in person. And again, it's a little bit tough. I can't see into the audience from here, but I believe that Senator Rich is there in the audience. So would invite her to join at the podium. Uh, having worked alongside Senator Rich for a number of years can tell you uh, that she is incredibly passionate about the issue of affordable housing. Uh, having first been elected to the Florida Senate in 2004, after serving two terms in the Florida House, she was the first woman to be elected state Senate Democratic leader. And that was a post that she held from 2010 until she was term limited in November of 2012. In November of 2016, Senator Rich was elected to serve as Broward County Commissioner and was reelected unopposed in 2020. Her involvement includes advocacy on behalf of women, children, and families. Prior to her election to the state legislature, she also served as a national president for the National Council of Jewish Women. She was the first Floridian elected to that office. She was honored to receive an appointment by President Bill Clinton to serve as a member of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum Council in Washington, DC. She currently serves on the board of directors of Kids in Distress. She is treasurer of the area count, I'm sorry, the area-wide council on aging for Broward County. She recently served as chair of Broward County's complete count committee for the 2020 census. Among her many long uh, lists of honors and awards, she's been inducted into the Broward County Women's Hall of Fame. She and her husband, David, have four children and three grandchildren. So Senator Nan Rich, we are very happy to, uh, to have you with us and we will give you as much time as you would like to share with us uh, insights about these affordable housing summit and anything else that you deem pertinent. So the floor is all yours, Senator. Okay, thank you so much, Katie. I'm just sorry you're not here. I hope uh, Buzz is feeling better. Uh, Miss you, but uh, I appreciate the introduction and all the years that uh, I had the opportunity of working with you. Um, so um, the one thing I can say about the census and what just happened with redistricting is that I lost plantation <laughs> and uh, my district got changed. So instead of going uh, north, uh, of 595 uh, with Weston and um, some small other areas. Uh, I ended up losing everything north of 595 and going back south of 95. So I went uh, 595. So I went back to uh, some of my Senate and House <laughs> districts uh, in Pembroke Pines and Miramar uh, and Southwest Ranches. But uh, uh, I, I, you know, you will always be my constituents and my friends, Lynn and Denise and everybody. So uh, I, um, I'm happy to be here today. And it's very uh, appropriate because we did have this affordable housing uh, summit today uh, and Maud was there. Yes, thank you so much for being there. Uh, and we had a really nice turnout um, and um, um, it's part of the um, prosperity uh, partnership uh, that's uh, the Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance has put together. And there are different pillars. And this today was the housing, affordable housing pillar. And uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of it along with Sandra Vesey Einhorn and uh, Walter Duke. And um, so it was, um, it was well attended. Uh, we also had a panel on homelessness. I also chair the, the uh, homeless continuum of care for Broward County, which fits right into affordable housing because as was mentioned today, uh, homelessness is resolved by housing. 
And uh, so there was a whole panel, you know, that was talking about uh, our shelters and um, um, this uh, Fran Esposito who heads the uh, our partnership for the homeless. Uh, they're building a new 72 unit uh, a building right on the corner of their property. They've taken away their parking lot and they're building this wonderful building, which is going to house some of their own employees because they need uh, workforce and affordable housing, as well as uh, people who are transitioning out of shelters and into um, housing. So uh, we have a lot of good things going on. Uh, there are some not such good things going on. I'll give you a little, a little bit of both if you don't mind. Um, so um, Dr. Murray, uh, Dr. Ned Murray was there today um, and he is the um, associate director uh, of the FIU Metropolitan Center. Uh, and um, they do, he does tremendous work on needs assessments all across well, all across the state. And actually um, I was able to get him to go up to testify at a committee in Tallahassee this year <clears throat> on affordable housing issues. And um, he did the needs assessment for the county in 2018. And we asked him to, to um, we contracted with him to do an update because of COVID and the impact of COVID. So uh, he just has come out with um, this is not a hundred percent complete because some of the census data didn't come in exactly when it should have. This has to do, this part has to do with a lot of real time uh, uh, analysis that he's done. <clears throat> and some, <clears throat> some of the 2020 census, as well as uh, the uh, America community um, survey that also provides data, but it's catastrophic. That's about the only word I can use. It goes beyond the word crisis in, in Broward County for housing. And you'll see, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I don't have it all marked off because we just printed it up when I got back to the office, he had sent it out to everybody and I will get a copy you know, sent to you all so that you can um, you know, pass it around uh, and uh, look at some of the statistics here, but I'll get, I'll get to that in a minute. I wanted to just share kind of first a, a few statistics that uh, we actually, that come out of the 2018 needs assessment. Um, and that is that, um, in 2018, only 12.7% of residents in Broward County could afford a, uh, to purchase a home at the uh, average median cost of a home, which was $360,000. Now, as of the end of March, the Florida Realtors came out with, and Dr. Murray validated it today, that less than 8% in Broward County can afford uh, media, uh, the, uh, uh, the, to purchase a, um, a house at the median cost level, uh, which is now $545,000, $545,000. Just think about that. And um, so it's an increase basically of about 34% from before the, the pandemic. So we have the high cost of housing, we have low wages, and they both contribute obviously to the crisis and on top of that, we have a very, very small supply of affordable housing in Broward County. Um, the crisis is, it's humanitarian, but it's also economic. And one of the things that was really good today was the mix of people that were there. And I think you saw that, Maud. So you had nonprofits, you had government, you had educational entities. Uh, uh, the new superintendent of public schools was there. Uh, it was held at Broward College, so uh, President Hale was there. Um, and then you had bankers and you had all kinds of business leaders. Um, and I have to say that it's, it's so important for the business community to get behind affordable housing because they, they have a tremendous impact in terms of explaining to people what the economic side of this is if you don't provide affordable housing. And you know, one of the things is that, you know, that businesses don't relocate to places where there's no place for people to live. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where we are today. And they all realize that. Um, how it impacts the economy. In 2018, approximately 54% of Broward's 760,000 uh, households, uh, own, um, owners and renters were cost burden. This has gone up dramatically uh, and I'll get to those figures in a minute. 
Um, in 2018, it was estimated that 147,000 uh, renter households were cost burdened and 77,000 uh, of the renter households were severely cost burdened, meaning the cost burden is 30, you're spending 30% of your family income on housing and severely cost burden is you're spending 50%. So that is the figure that went up, unfortunately, the people that are severely cost, uh, cost burden. Um, the significant growth is severely in, in severely cost burden renters is um, the most pressing problem uh, due to increasing demand for renter housing throughout the county, resulting in low vacancy weight rates. And you'll see that here too, uh, and spiraling increases in rent prices and lack of affordable rental housing production um, and rent crisis in, prices increasing faster than wages. So that was pretty much the, the, those are the statistics pretty much with the exception of the one I gave you on the cost of single family housing were 2018. So the story that he gave us today obviously was much more dramatic and, and very sobering. But I, I, I had the opportunity today to speak and share what the county has been doing since uh, 2016 with regard to affordable housing. And I think it's important, uh, you know, really for people to know how much the county has done, the commitment that we've had to affordable housing in our community. So uh, the um, in 2016, uh, I became chair of something called the Coordinating Council of Broward. I don't know if you've any, any of you have heard of that, but it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an organization that's uh, comprised of all of Broward's largest human service stakeholders. So it would be the hospital districts, the school board, the county, United Way. Um, uh, it, it, it's um, pretty extensive. Uh, uh, Broward Behavioral Health Coalition, Child Net, which is our child welfare organization, all the, the largest uh, human service organizations. And when I took over as chair, um, uh, the best thing I did was with my friend, Cindy Ehrenberg Seltzer, who chairs the Children's Services Council was to hire Sandra Bessie Einhorn as our CEO. <laughs> and she has done a phenomenal, phenomenal job. Um, but um, one of the things we did immediately was to uh, conduct a, a comprehensive uh, strategic plan. There had never had been one in Broward County for affordable housing. And it's called Housing Broward and Inclusive Plan. And um, that's kind of laid the groundwork for the last five years uh, of things that we have done with exception, little, little bumps like the pandemic along the way. Um, so one of our goals, uh, one of our goals in, um, in 2018 was to pass the uh, affordable, Broward County Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which we did. And um, I'm extremely proud of that because in the legislature, I worked very hard to try and get the Sadowski Fund not to be swept. And as many of you know, it was created in 1992 by the Florida legislature. And it was created with the idea that the trust fund was specifically for affordable housing purposes and nothing else. Well, starting in 2002, and I got to the legislature originally in 2000, starting in 2002, they started to sweep the trust fund. And um, so we decided that we would create our own here, but with one big difference, that it's a lockbox. Anything that goes into this affordable housing trust fund, general fund money, grant money, donations, wh whatever it may be, once it goes in there, it may not be used for anything but affordable housing. And it gave us a, a, some money, which the county had never put aside before for what we call gap financing. So when developers come and they, they apply for an RFP or an RFA, uh, they, need, they need some support, financial support to make the, the, the deal work. Uh, because land is expensive, construction costs are high. So the average is about $5 million uh, uh, gap financing for uh, each development that we do. And um, so we started um, with uh, $5 million the first year, 2018. And through currently this year, we've put in um, 35 million. Um, and then we had, we were very fortunate this year, we had $47 million 
from the federal government through the ARP, the, the, the ARP program. And we took that money and we converted it to use for general fund. And we, um, we passed several weeks ago, seven large projects and two land acquisitions. Unfortunately, none of them are in plantation because nobody applied from plantation for, for any of them. But I'm hoping that maybe in the future, uh, you may be doing that and maybe just being here and hearing all of this, you may uh, feel that this is, you might have an opportunity to do something like this. So these are all shovel ready projects. Uh, they all had, uh, we're not gonna have to have zoning issues, battles or anything. Uh, they um, were, um, uh, because the money has to be used by 2026. And by the way, these are all, these are not mixed use or mixed income, these. These particular ones are all multifamily units, affordable housing. So it's 1,025 units, which is a really significant amount, not in this whole scheme of what we need, as, as you've heard what I've said, but, but for us, it was, uh, it was you know, quite good. It totaled six, six different cities, um, and it went across uh, seven of the nine um, commission districts. So they weren't all built like say in Fort Lauderdale or you know, on the east side they were, they ranged all the way over to Pembroke Pines, Davie and a couple of other cities over there as well. Um, so given the extreme affordable housing crisis, this really is, an, this was an extraordinary opportunity to provide, as I said, 1,025 units in Broward. Um, then we just enacted, um, and I will tell you this, which was an ordinance that I sponsored, it was modeled after the Miami-Dade, a Miami-Dade ordinance, and it, um, we, we moved it along very quickly without having to set for a public hearing, uh, because it's important that we do this now, and this requires landlords to provide written notification, a written notification period of not the 30 days that ha has been in the ordinance all across the, the, the state, but this one is going to at least 60 days notice before the end of an annual lease, if the landlord intends to raise the rent by more than 5%. And we know that the rents are going up if they're draconian. We had a woman testify the day we passed this. She was renting her house for uh, maybe a couple of decades, I think, and her husband had just passed away and she was on you know fixed income. And they raised her rent from $1,350 to $1,950. And she could not afford it. She had to, to leave. So, um, and given the limited supply, as I mentioned before, this gives the tenant at least a little bit more of an opportunity to find an affordable unit or to negotiate an acceptable rent increase. Uh, we're trying to do everything we can at the county level to address the affordable housing crisis in our community. Um, so even some of the smaller things we're, we're going ahead and passing them because it all kind of uh, adds, adds up to something maybe more significant. And this is especially because the, our legislature consistently preempts the local, local governments from implementing common sense regulation. I mean, there is not any kind of rent control or anything that, that any, any city basically can do in, in this state. So, uh, but this is not something that was preempted. So we went ahead and, and uh, you know, moved on this one. Um, let me just see a couple more things. Okay, we also, um, we have also made some changes to our, um, to our land use and zoning uh, requirements to encourage more affordable housing development uh, and create a more new units. So we're now promoting transit oriented development um, and uh, with an emphasis on affordable housing, uh, offering obviously um, additional bonus units um, for putting things uh, you know, along transportation corridors. We changed the formula for municipal for municipalities, I'm sure you're aware of this, but uh, or I'm sure Mayor Stoner is uh, the um, uh, the calculation of affordable housing needs used to be that you could uh, uh, combine your low, very low, low and moderate income needs together, so that if you had enough moderate to cover, then that would be it. You could say that you met the, uh, the planning council requirements. And now this, we, we have divided it out. This was a recommendation from 
uh, Dr. Murray, is that we, 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 we get a better handle on what the needs are. And now we, every, every, the municipalities, when they come in for a, a, a land use change, have to come in with a breakdown of the three different categories so that we know exactly. Because I think there are just three cities, I think it's maybe, uh, maybe not right now after what's going on, but I think there are just three cities that, have, uh, that, that don't have enough moderate, but none, none of them have enough low or very low. So, um, okay, and then um, just, uh, let me see what else, anything else here that's, yeah. Okay, so, and then let me just mention about what we're gonna be trying to do in the legislature this year on, on behalf of the county. So, um, you know, advocacy is something I'm, it's like in my, in my soul. So I go up to Tallahassee still to, to lobby on, on important things for the county and we have our own team up there. So uh, we're going to continue to try to modify the Sadowski Trust Fund statute formula to make it more relevant for today's uh, needs. And when I say that, it's that um, currently the formula in the statute requires at least 65% of the awarded SHIP money, that's the state the housing for, for homes. It must be awarded for home ownership. And the statute indicates that no more than 25% may be used for rental housing. Well, that may have been okay for 1992, but it's not okay for the needs of today. We are a built out, uh, Florida is just one of uh, large urban counties that are essentially built out. We don't have land to build 147,000 units here that are what's, what's needed. Um, and uh, we need flexibility and we need every tool available to address uh, the housing crisis. So, um, and in addition, of course, we're also gonna try and get them to live up to their word. Because if you might remember in the 2021 session, the legislature passed a bill that was signed into law by the governor that permanently diverts 50% of the Sadowski Affordable Housing Trust Fund for non-housing purposes. And the legislature had promised <laughs> not to continue to sweep the Sadowski funds, but their track record is pretty abysmal. And of course, this, this year they did sweep and it's an interesting way that they did it. They created, some of you may have heard of this Hometown Heroes. Uh, okay, so that's a non-existent program right now, okay? Um, there was a bill and the bill didn't go anywhere. One of the legislators, you know, got a hold of it and was in a position to move it forward. And they went ahead and they took a hundred million dollars, not from the ship funds, which is housing because the hometown heroes program is for uh, police, fire, healthcare workers, uh, teachers, and it's for low cost uh, loans for homes. So if you're going to take $100 million for that, you should take it out of ship. Instead, they took it out of sale, which is the apartment, the multifamily. So now leaves about, about $50 million for the entire state left in the multifamily compartment. So that is not what they promised. So we're gonna, we're gonna try and get them to, you know, kind of work on that again. But the 50-50 formula, what we're, this is what we're doing. We're asking them, and the new incoming Senate president who will be uh, Kathleen Pasadomo is very interested in affordable housing. I've talked to her at length. I had Dr. Murray go up, he let her testify before her, her committee. And uh, she is very interested in this and uh, wants to change this formula to something more realistic. And we've suggested a 50-50. So that up to 50% could be used for one and up to 50% for the other. But the flexibility would be there. So if you're in a rural county and you don't need all the multifamily housing, you could use more of the, of the, of the money for uh, single family homes. But if you're in Dade or Broward, you know, or Hillsborough or you know, any other urban, big urban county, that really needs the multifamily, then you would be able to go up above that 25% that, that is in the statute currently today. So those are, those are just some of the things that, um, that we're doing. And lastly, I just wanna mention that, um, you know, we, we've, made, we've made a really good start. We've done a lot of good things, I think in the county. Um, and we'd like to get all of our municipalities on board with us. 
uh, and we're going to continue to work on that. But um, we have, as Dr. Murray said today, we have a long way to go. And we can't really depend on others. We can't depend on the state, you can see, as because of Sadowski. And the federal government, you know, the, the 47 million, generous as it was, is a one-time uh, amount for, for one, you know, for just that, this, this one uh, uh, purpose for the ARP uh, funding out of, out of Washington. So um, we, everybody there really kind of agreed today. I mean, that we, we, we all need to, uh, we must do it locally. We have to do it ourselves. So I have been, since I got on the commission in 2016, I've been looking at something that was done in Alameda County, California. That's uh, the environs of Oakland, Emeryville, Berkeley, uh, you know, all those cities. Um, and they did an affordable housing uh, bond issue uh, they put it on the ballot, um, and uh, they, I have, you know, researched a, a lot of counties and municipalities who have done this around the country, but this one seems to be really outstanding. It was a general, it is a general obligation bond in the amount of $580 million that was on the ballot, as I said. It was passed in November 2016 by a 73% vote, 73% in favor, and 26% against. Now that these are, these are people that were willing, 456,000 of them were willing to tax themselves to provide affordable rental housing uh, and prevent displacement of vulnerable populations, including low and moderate income households, veterans, seniors, youth aging out of foster care, persons with disabilities, homeless, all the things that we are, we're using for, for our funding as well. Um, and the, the measure provided also th uh, that its uh, proceeds would, would also be used for, um, uh, for uh, uh, home ownership as well and uh, renovation of existing homes, which is very important. As a matter of fact, one of the things in Dr. Murray's study is really that's scary is that the number of homes in Broward County that were built more than 50 years ago before the changes after Hurricane Andrew, the building changes, and they are so vulnerable. And we had um, uh, Robin Wright was on one of the panels today and he uh, heads up uh, rebuilding. rebuilding. Yeah, he, he and does a great job. And they've, uh, over the past few years, they've done 435 renovations of homes. And that in, was included in their bond issue as well. And we include that in our, in our funding as well. But it's kind of scary when you think about all those homes that, you know, and they replace the windows and impact windows and doors and, you know, all, all roofs and all different kinds of things. So it, it was, it was um, uh, you know, it's interesting to see. But the, the business community is, is very interested in this. Uh, and we're going to, we're going to begin to look at it and um, hopefully maybe we'll be able to do something with it. I understand that Palm Beach County uh, has been looking at it and they're looking at a $200 million bond. Um, and uh, I, I don't think that's enough, uh, knowing what I know about the 100,000 plus that we need. And uh, this, this one right now, it, um, when, it, when it gets, when it's complete, it's supposed to be 8,500 units, this, this um, um, uh, Alameda County one, and they've so far they've done 3,800 units uh, since it was it was passed. So um, lots of you know lots of things out there. We have lots of needs, and again, um, we need to take responsibility here in our community locally uh, to try and and uh, do the best we can. And I, I just want to make one last comment about affordable, because um, we have worked really hard to educate people about affordable housing that it's not section eight housing. It's for so many different kinds of people. You know, everybody in our workforce almost, when you look at the figures today now uh, of what you have to be earning in order to not be cost burden, um, you, you have people that are in, in cer certainly all of our service sectors, hospitality, uh, childcare workers, don't go down the list. It's just unbelievable the numbers of people who need affordable housing. And uh, so we're going to try and see if uh, we can work on this. And um, as I said, in Alameda County, every city participated uh, and they all got money and they all uh, have used it for the, all of these different purposes for uh, uh, building and renovating uh, affordable housing. So 
um, that's my report. And um, I, uh, if any questions, I'm happy to answer. And if I, if you want, I can just pick out those few pages that have statistics on you all. <laughs> they did the, like the top ten of the, in each area. So uh, they, they, this is one that was I thought was really interesting for you all. Um, yeah, here's. Um, Oh, well, here they, he did a single family home affordability analysis and uh, analysis, and this was uh, 2020. So the, he had like 10 cities, Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood, Pembroke Pines, you know, and you're, you are here. And then they have the, you, they have you at down as, as um, 577,000 is the median sale price, uh, median, median sale price, no, no, median sale price. And then the affordability gap, meaning what, how much more that is than most people can pay, you, you have one of the, the higher ones, which is $350,285. So that can tell you why only 8% of people can afford to purchase a home at the, uh, at the median sale price. Now they can obviously go lower, but that's, that's one of the big factors. And there was one other one that was, but I think, you know, as I said, I'll send this to you so that, you know, you can share it with everybody. And, um, let me see. Yeah, you are listed. Actually, you had the highest rate of vacancy of any. It's low. It's two point four percent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that you had the highest. Hallandale, Hollywood was one percent. Um, uh, Cooper City uh, was one percent. One point six. Uh, Pompano Beach one point five. Fort Lauderdale was 0. 0.6. Yeah. So very very low vacancy. You know rates in the county. And then uh, let me just see. Oh, and then rents, uh, rents by submarkets. So um, uh, one bedroom. And I, I look at this in 2018 when he did the study. A two bedroom, the average two bedroom was nineteen hundred and two dollars in in Broward County. It is now twenty. Uh, you you and our plantation is twenty six hundred and forty eight. So it gives you a, a sense of what's happened to the to the rents. Um, and you're not the highest one either. <laughs> You've got uh, Fort Lauderdale's 3,300 for a two bedroom apartment. Um, Pembroke Pines Miramar 2,600. It's, it, it's like I said, it's it's a it's quite dramatic, and uh, it just is um, something we need to you know we need to kind of really begin to to work hard on. So locally here and and um, help people who need it. Madam oh, Ch it. Yeah. Chair, may I? Um... I, I beeped in, but you don't have the little thing right there beside you. I don't. Uh, thank you for that. Mayor Stoner, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, so I think about this a lot and I try to come up with different scenarios because it's a big bucket. It's huge. It's huge. Um, how do we tiptoe into this? Uh, as you indicated, we are basically dealing with infill. Um, we do have some affordable housing. However, uh, most people want the great new finishes, and, but they don't want to pay the price. Uh, and when I started off being married a gazillion years ago, it was 30% as acceptable portion of your income right. for your house. Um, and reading that we are quickly up to 50%. But, well, that's two different things now. Remember, that's cost burdened and then severely cost burdened. Yes. Okay. Because yes. the 50%, when they're saying severely cost burdened, you have to think about the, you know, pe people's transportation, their food, their childcare, all, all the other things, yeah. healthcare that they right. may not be able to afford. 30% is, is the, the highest. That's cost burdened anything above 30%. So, right. yeah. So, but everything has a consequence and a domino effect. Is there one or two pieces that seem to be the right place to start and fix? Is it education, trade schools? Um, do we dip in the, the, the housing market? Um, we have one project up mm -hmm. before council that is, 375 units, which includes 20 affordable. Um, 
it's a tiptoe mm -hmm. and tip certainly <laughs> not the the so, the yeah. solution to what we're looking mm -hmm. at but when they did the study did they how did they determine what amount of affordable housing each city could uh, bear the capacity is there any because quite well, honestly don't. we haven't had anyone come in yeah. here and ask for assistance with affordable housing not one builder it's interesting because well I, the, the, the number one could be maybe you don't have i mean i know you must have land you have some land of the city yeah no we don't buy and bake. no 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 i don't I, but land that's um for sale some, or, but it's yeah. not it's not a visible vacancy it's yeah. going to take yeah. an entrepreneur to assemble and then build versus uh, a parcel of 20 some acres that already exists yeah well that's what happened with the with the nine that we did mm -hmm. i mean seven of them that that we we were amazed that the the the, the quality caliber uh, and the experience of the affordable housing developers that, that that responded to the rfa it was amazing and that's why i had to work really hard with our former administrator uh you know to say listen we need all of this 47 million dollars because we've got nine developments here okay. that are you know that are ready right. to go right you know um now you, you know I, I i guess i can't answer i mean i know that like uh, it, just the infill piece there are there are people like Habitat for Humanity that scour looking yes. for you know for yes. for infill pieces and and they are building a 70 78 unit um, uh, um, project right now but those are those are going to be few and far between because of the fact that they're single family you know so that's why we're, we're pushing more like we did here with these nine. Uh, the multifamily units. Um, and they are all over the county, yes. They're all over the county. We have Pembroke Pines. We've got uh, uh, two in Pompano, one in Lauderdale, one in Hollywood, one in Davie. Um, I think the last one. Anyway, that's, they're, they're all over the county, pretty much and all over the county, which made me be, feel good because um, we, you know, it's not only going just back to Lauderdale or, yes. or you know, something yes. like that, right? Um, and we've heard about the one on off of Peters Road that's a thousand, um, which has, and, and while that's not within our uh, city per se, it's yeah. it's within a mile it's of our property mile, yeah. boundaries. Right. And, right. and a lot of people are concerned and I know we have tried to have conversations with those developers and we're getting mm -hmm. closed doors. We're not getting and being able to have a conversation about what's coming in and that we can really take a look at it. And can we do something to tweak it a little bit yeah. so that it's yeah. a little more palatable? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I'm well, in order, in order in order to get the gap financing, they have to do certain things like and we, we see we're not allowed uh, because the legislature is preempted. We can't mandate, for instance, at the planning council. I sit on the planning council, but we have almost everybody that comes in now does a 15 percent if they're not doing all affordable which all of these that we're doing, these are all affordable, okay. but, but the, 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 they'll come in and they'll voluntarily say, okay, 15%, you know, of their project yeah, of the project would be okay. Affordable. So that's pretty much the rule of thumb right now gotcha. is the 15%. Yeah. Yeah. So that goes uh, through all of the uh, groups. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can specify, but we, we, we try to tell, ask people to just kind of do, you know, right. some of, some of all of them. So you don't just leave, you know. And how um, quickly them. are they filling up? As quickly oh, as you as finish? quick. Oh, as, as quick. Yeah, yeah. As quickly as they, they get finished, they're they're filled. So yeah. has there been a decrease in the impact on the county uh, now that you have the so-called homeless in um, their own places, or is no, it? We, no, I I wouldn't say that yet. Not yet. <laughs> Um, yeah, we just started a landlord initiative, rec recruitment initiative uh, with, I chair the homeless continuum of care. Yes. We just start, we just started that and we're going to, we're, we're getting a lot of landlords that are coming in. Um, it's, it's hard because the, the, because they can, they can raise the rents. And sure. so, you know, and we're, we're just working with HUD 
to raise the, the, uh, our rate that we get reimbursed up to the market rate because otherwise we you know we're in a very bad position there you know with not being able to go above right that that uh, rate for the um, um, you know for the low very low or moderate couldn't go above it but now we're we're, we're looking at where we're getting we're going to get approval to do that which will help yeah um, and then you know we've had a problem because of covid uh, you have a lot of um, our shelters were down to 25% capacity because of COVID. We had right. to separate people and, you know, and a lot of people didn't want to come into the shelter, you know, so that was very tough because people were living in their cars, you know, and, um, and uh, uh, sad. Um, but now we're back up to about 70% capacity at the shelters. Um, and, um, and then, you know, we're looking at the, at the rapid rehousing and the permanent supportive housing. And that's why, you know, we need to build these units because, right. you know, we need to have places and it's not only for them, it's mental health. It's when you go to look at the Barra Behavioral Health Coalition, you have people coming out of all kinds of programs. They have to get, go into some kind of a supportive, right. supportive care, uh, kind of so a program. So if we provide all that, do we provide... Um, some kind of training or education so that they can, in fact, increase their uh, earning capacity? Yeah, I'll tell you, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, when Fran Esposito um, presented today, she talked about in, this, in the new building, which is 72 units, it, they have, uh, they've got all kinds of technology there and training to, to help you know, people mm -hmm. be able to increase their level of uh, competence, whether it's computers or, you know, whatever it might be. Yeah, I mean, that has to go along with it. That's the supportive part of it. Carrefour okay. is another one. It's a nonprofit developer. They are terrific. I'm sorry, what was Carrefour, that? Carrefour, C-A-R-R-F-O-U-R. Okay. They're going to be building a, um, we, we, we got this through, it's on the Howard Foreman campus in Pembroke Pines, and it's a it's a, a hundred units for um, um, for people, young people who have mental illness. That the it's it was sponsored by NAMI because their parents worried about what. And some of these, they're not kids. They're eight, they're right. thirty eight. They're forty. They're right. you know. And uh, so we're, we're going to be building that on that campus, which is a really good project. Um, they're a very good uh, nonprofit developer. Good. Uh, they did the Wilton Manors uh, senior uh, housing mm -hmm. uh, that has su the supportive services as well. So certain populations, you know, you have to have the supportive services. Others, it's straight right. affordable housing. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. And I will put you in touch me. with Ralph Stone and uh, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see if we can figure out some yeah, ways to kind of bring you into this fold. Yeah. Edwin, I think you had a question. You're recognized. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good Ms. afternoon. First of all, thank you very much for all the for your putting and helping the community. You're welcome. My pleasure. Um, well, I work with Legal Aid of Broward County, and we have some. Well, I have some concerns, and, and let me let me share those with you. Mm -hmm. um, the to start with the ordinance 2022-21. It's my understanding that that doesn't help any tenant right now. That was the benefit of the rental notices is only towards leases that start on May 1st of this year. No, no, no. Ours is starting right now. And, and any, anybody that has a lease, anybody that has a lease, no, that's not, that's not our ordinance. Our ordinance starts now. And so anyone who has an annual lease, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they cannot, the landlord uh, has to notify them uh, for a minimum of 60 days yes. before before they can, uh, you know, before they leave or they evict them or whatever, so the lease is up. And, you know. and that's what my concern is because yeah. I understand the intention, but when I read in that the provisions of this article shall apply prospectively from May 1st, 2022, and shall not apply to or supersede the terms of any residential tenancy or renewals where the terms are binding on landlords and tenants that existed prior to May 1st, 2022, means that if I have right now a lease, I cannot use this. I think that was more of an impairment of contracts issue and then figuring when the ordinance goes into effect, right. it's hard to go back 
to yep. what something would have happened in February. So you look at it and figure going forward, this I, is the- I understand that. I just want to precise that the effect of this is uh, because I've seen and, and it generates expectations on the people. So our role now is to clarify for everybody, every member in the community that because the commission did something good moving forward, they cannot forward. affect the right of contracts no, that people had when they enter into these leases. So here is the problem with that. The increases are happening as we speak. And unless that is um, another thing that I want to mention, if there is a new lease, then the landlord slash owner can ask for any money at this point. That's not a rent increase. That's just that's uh, the, the money that, that is requested. So right. that's right. one concern that we have. And, and again, our and role we, is to clarify and, those. And as I mentioned, we are prohibited by state statute, by, by the state, mm -hmm. preempted by the state from having anything to say you know, about a, a person can, when the person leaves, they can raise their rent, you know, and get a new tenant into what, whatever they want. I mean, we have no rent control of any kind. And no, I understand we, that. Yeah, we can't touch that, unfortunately. We can't do anything about that. That's, Correct. You know. and, and that goes to the safety yeah. that the parties need to have in yeah. order to continue with their contractual relationships. And we understand that. But again, my concern is that this is creating some expectation in the community that this applies immediately to their present mm -hmm. leases. And that's not going to happen. Um, the other thing that I'm, I try to, to share with you, because it's, it's rare the opportunity to speak with, with um, a commissioner of Broward County, is, um, for example, the average uh, rent in Broward County nowadays is $2,800. So if we consider that this should be the equivalent of 30% of the income of a household, mm -hmm. that means that this household for this family should have an income of about $9,300, which translate into having at least $112,000 per year income. And um, this is really a very yeah. difficult matter in the sense that it's not just affecting, and, and my point bring, uh, bringing this to you to, and of course you know that, mm -hmm. but bringing this to the attention of everyone here is, yeah. this is not that we're talking about affordable housing for people that is not too um, predisposed to work or do their no, effort no, on their part. people that are working. Yes, and, yes. and we're talking about teachers, mm -hmm. uh, firefighters, paramedics, uh, even police officers, mm -hmm. attorneys, of course, legal aid attorneys, I know that for sure. So all of this, again, presents a huge problem because right. we do not have a clear concept of what's affordable housing. Sometimes we think that affordable housing goes to just the people that is in the low spectrum of the um, range of income, but it's not the case anymore because of the increase on rents. And this is the other thing that is, is very dramatic. In 1950, you, you were able to buy a house uh, for a less um, money that you were gonna spend on buying two brand new cars. In 1970s, the investors were not involved on that and whatnot, but since the 80s and the 90s and so forth, there has been a more active participation of investors on this. Now, why is the problem that is, is being created nowadays? In the 1950s, 60s, 70s, the families were able to gain equity from this investment in a house and the middle class that we are mostly uh, all part of it, the middle class was able to obtain a loan from a mm -hmm. bank giving mm -hmm. this um, yeah. ownership as a, a collateral or they were able to sell the house or whatnot, and they were benefiting the, the family as getting this loan for um, paying student loans and colleges and whatnot, right. or starting a business. But here is the problem nowadays. It is Investors have in, uh, realized that prices, regardless of that up and downs, are gonna keep growing. And now they are investing on buying houses, meaning even if you qualify for a loan, you cannot, buy cash for this property that you want to buy. Since you cannot, then you are outside of who is the, the prime group of acquiring houses. What's the problem with that? The problem with that is that the families that cannot afford to buy that will have to rent yeah. with a higher uh, amount of money. But more importantly, they are losing all the equity in those 15 well, yeah. or 20 years. It's, it's, Meaning exactly. we are becoming 
a nation of mm -hmm. renters in which the middle class is going to collapse. Yeah, well, this is, a, I mean, there are articles, I read all these articles in the paper, really, it's a, it's a whole issue about the wealth gap because people are not able to buy homes and invest in them. And especially, you know, in where we live, I mean, we, we, all the studies are showing that we are the most unaffordable place to live, not only in Florida, but the nation. So, you know, it's, it, and it's, it is sad because, you know, this, the whole idea of, and I understand when, you know, people say, but, you know, the idea is to own your own home. And that's the American way, American dream. And it's, you know, it's very hard today when, especially when you look at what I just said to you, I mean, if it's $577,000, so 200 and some odd thousand, $60,000 is the gap. <laughs> Someone can't, can't afford to do it. And it is, it's, it's very sad. You know, uh, I, that's why I think you, Habitat for Humanity, for instance, I use as an example, they are doing some wonderful work because, you know, they're building homes in it and people that would have never had the opportunity you know, are moving in with their kids. It's such a wonderful thing to see, but it's small. It's a small, you know, we just need to find more, you know. Uh, I think anything counts. That. That's, that's my approach yeah. because we're not going to be resolving this problem, which is massive. It's not, it's, massive. it's not a local problem or a state level problem. No, it's it's no. massive. And, yeah. uh, and besides, again, the problem with affordability is that it's not affecting only the, the really low income class uh, um, um, families. It's mm -hmm. affecting middle class as well. And we are noticing that on any possible aspect. And at Legal Aid, we used to have a universe of clients, and that has changed dramatically. Mostly in the pandemic, uh, professionals start asking for our services because they were not able to, well, they lost their jobs because of the pandemic, and they were not able to go back to the levels in which they were making money before. In some professions, yes, they have uh, recovered, but in some others, they are not. not. Services is, is a really terrible thing now. Yeah, very terrible. Well, you bring up some really good points and we'll, you know, I'll bring them all back. We're, we're, we're looking, you know, for solutions and uh, you. we're, you know, try as hard as we can. Thank you. And yeah. Okay. All right. And Senator Rich, when we're also talking about areas where we are um, built out and we don't have the infrastructure or the availability to, uh, you know, build maybe a five or even an eight acre type project um, for multifamily apartment rentals, et cetera. And we're looking at the need to, you know, put more again, inventory and give people a mix of options, whether it's a single family residence or a condo. Uh, I think we had touched on this topic at the last meeting, but it probably bears repeating when we're looking at state policies and looking at again, inventory and um, now, an area of critical concern is how homes are being used as vacation rentals versus housing and providing the opportunity for people to own a home and to live there and be a part of community. And you have to think about the local governments and the way that they have planned and they have developed these neighborhoods to perform function and uh, be a part of that community in a certain way having more units available without having to give out money, without having to look at concurrency, roads, building more things, things that take time, raw land that's expensive, all of those things. And you think about, we already have inventory there. We just have individuals using it a certain way, which is not helping to resolve this larger crisis. And I think you were right early on to say catastrophic. And years ago, when we had people that were underwater, individual property owners who maybe had to relocate, who had a situation, divorce, whatever, they could not sell the home for whatever reason. That ability to rent a home certainly filled that need, but that dynamic has changed. And I think the vacation rental homes have worked into something very different than what people in the legislature like me supported them for years ago. And I think that, again, looking at the, the sheer number of inventory and helping to provide that. At last count, I was looking in Florida, over 170,000. 170,000. We think about the, the number of units that we're talking about and decisions that local governments have to make to try to find who has property available. What developer can I entice, incentivize 
And we're all taking a step back and thinking, well, wait a minute, we have homes. We also have nice hotels for people who wanna to come to Florida to maybe rent or stay. Maybe the focus needs to be providing more long-term rental options closer towards the beach. These are the days where people need, you know, those types of options for lodging, et cetera. So I would just um, encourage you to talking as well to Senator Pasadomo and others to look at that as a way to, again, help bring more inventory back to market. Yeah. And that's, again, something that was preempted by the state and they would have to change state, state law you know, to, to deal with that. And the other piece, which I didn't mention, of course, is that so many people are moving here from other places, you know, and, uh, you know, the Midwest and North and, uh, uh, and then you have companies, there was a 60 minute segment, I don't know if anybody saw it, but it was, you know, showing uh, these billionaires companies that are buying up all these houses. And, uh, you know, then they jack up the, 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 you know, the rents on them, and they rent them. So, it's it's we, we we seem to be hit from all you know from all angles, um, but uh, like I said, we just you know we just have to keep plugging away and uh, and uh, it's like I said, it's it's just you can't rely on the state, you can't rely on feds. You really have to we have to figure it out in our county to how to how to do this. Yeah. So, do we have any members that have uh, questions for Sandra Rich or anybody who is participating? online through Zoom before she leaves us. And of course, you're welcome to stay. We're talking about inclusionary zoning and reviewing our list, our inventory list, but we appreciate the information and dialogue. I'll tell you what, if you don't mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. I, I had to get up so early. This thing started at 7.30 this morning, the, the affordable housing thing. And then I had a two hour workshop on the joint campus uh, government center for, for the Broward County and Fort Lauderdale. And that was torture, excuse me. Torture. Of what? Let me tell you what, you should know that I'm, I made my statement. Look, this has been going on for a long time, but if I had my way, I had my satellite office at Government Center West. I don't anymore because, you know, but I loved it. And I, I said the Government Center should be in the middle of Broward County, okay? Yeah. So, I mean, if, if it falls through, I'll call you. <laughs> Find us some land. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll get them. Thank you. I'll get them for. I'll get them for. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, and thank for your thoughtful comments. Thank you, Senator Rich. You're welcome. Good to see you. Uh, moving on to our next item of new business, I'll turn it over to Mr. Holmes to present. Um, I would ask for a bit of indulgence just because the inclusionary zoning topic is so interesting and fun. I think that could make up one whole meeting in and of itself just to walk through a lot of the questions that have been asked um, are somewhat addressed in that bill. And there was also uh, one of the questions that Mayor Stoner had hit on, which is the training, the education, making sure that those individuals who are the beneficiaries of programs. So I think we can also incorporate that into the next meeting, what's already available, and how they can be performing better. I think that's a really great question as well. Um, Mr. Holmes, I'll turn it over to you. I know you wanted to present on uh, the list of city or public owned land, so we can include that as part of our discussion and check that box. Okay. Good evening. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Um, for the record, Dan Holmes, Planning, Zoning, and Economic Development Director. I, I found the discussion that we were just having uh, very interesting. I can tell you, I just returned um, the other day from the National uh, Conference of the American Planning Association uh, out in San Diego. And I made it, I guess, uh, my point this year, because they, you know, you can have, you know, you can kind of uh, have your little areas that you want to kind of specialize in if you're more interested in affordable housing or transportation related issues, uh, you know, there's uh, various uh, sessions related to that. But I made it my point 
this year to focus on most of the affordable housing uh, sessions. And uh, very, very good information. I mean, I think California is really, in my opinion, where I think uh, things are really happening. I mean, I think the state there is taking a very um, aggressive approach to uh, ensuring that local governments are doing their part in the provision of uh, affordable housing. Uh, it's, it's interesting that she mentioned uh, Alameda County. I actually sat in on a session where they talked about uh, what they were doing in, in Alameda County, uh, Oakland, for example, because they were having a very severe housing uh, issue there. Uh, in fact, they had a, a large segment of their population even leave the area uh, because uh, the crisis was uh, so significant there. But essentially, uh, California has required that local governments identify, and this is something that's tied into approval of their comprehensive plans, that they have to identify what their affordable housing need is. And they, and they have to get it down to an actual number of units that they need to provide in order to address the affordable housing uh, in their area. So they have to go through and they work with sort of the regional uh, planning agencies in the state to come up with that number. Uh, and, and of course, every eight years, they have to go back and reassess that and, and, and start all over again. But I, what I found interesting is that there, there are basically two um, tools that most of the local governments there um, are really utilizing that they're finding very effective in assisting with the provision of affordable housing. One is inclusionary zoning. And the other is really looking at um, accessory um, dwelling units. That's the other way that they are really, uh, you know, addressing the issue. Because as we said, that, that one of the issues is, is they're not making, we, we don't have any more land here. So accessory dwelling units was really a, a way of taking inventory of existing, uh, you, know, um, you know, residential, um, uh, zone property and adding more density to the residential zone property. Uh, and, and of course, then with inclusionary zoning, as you can look at not just a property that's zoned residential, but in fact, uh, as, uh, as, as uh, Commissioner Rich just indicated, that, um, you know, we can look to doing like transit oriented design, you know, kind of coupled with uh, affordable housing to make sure we're putting it in the right place. And therefore, you can start looking also at commercial uh, properties and even, you know, in some areas, they even look at residential properties. So I, I even sat in on a session to see how uh, those local governments kind of go through that process of uh, identifying their number, looking at their inventory of, you know, commercial lands that meet certain uh, acreage criteria, what have you, and then focusing on those parcels that they find and, and you know, uh, putting uh, the right zoning in place there and trying to encourage, uh, you know, uh, the provision of additional affordable housing there. But one other thing I'll say before I, before I get going here is that the other thing that most of them indicated that once they kind of really were forced into this process, uh, even though the the city was trying to do its part, they they ran into a lot of nimbyism, you know, where you know the community was you know up in arms at saying, "Look, we don't want this housing here and here." So there were you know there were some interesting sessions too that uh, some of the uh, local governments kind of talked about how they approach you know um, education of the public. So once you get those metrics in place, then it's going to be important for you to also begin to educate the public on, you know, first of all, just letting them know who this housing is for. A lot of people are surprised once they see the numbers, uh, as we said, uh, looking at our, our numbers here, that and who this housing is going to be for. It's, it's for your parents, for one, as they age, it's for your kids as they graduate from college and they come, you know, back home. What, what, you know, what are they going to afford? Uh, so, you know, so it's kind of interesting and in, in kind of quelling uh, some of the nimbyism that they, they ran into. So I kind of come back with some ideas. And as we as, as we're going to we're getting ready to begin our process uh, very shortly with uh, updating our comprehensive plan. And that is going to be one of the focuses for us is to look at 
um, through our housing element, uh, looking at what our, you know, basic our numbers are so that we have some better data and then we can look at uh, solutions uh, to, to uh, identifying, uh, you know, parcels and, and how we can approach that. And, and as I said, one of the uh, tools, very effective tools that uh, a lot of the governments recognize is inclusionary zoning. So, so with that, let's talk about uh, inclusionary zoning. So inclusionary zoning um, and, and, and is, a, is one tool to help increase the stock of affordable housing uh, in, in a community. Uh, in Florida, thousands of affordable units have been created through inclusionary zoning policies. Whether you're uh, in a, a built urban community or you're in a rural area, inclusionary zoning is a, is a tool that you can actually use to uh, increase the, uh, the supply and production of uh, long-term affordable housing. Now, inclusionary zoning uh, is an affordable housing tool that requires some market rate developers to also, let me move uh, to the next slide there. Okay. So inclusionary zoning is, is an affordable housing tool that requires some market rate developers uh, to also develop units for affordable, low and moderate income. And that's kind of what uh, Commissioner Rich was just talking about that, you know, they're mixing uh, different types of units and developments. The number of affordable housing units is typically given a percentage. She said 15% is kind of the going number that they're working with now uh, of the total number of units developed. Inclusionary zoning can come in a variety of forms. Inclusionary zoning can be an ordinance that covers an entire uh, jurisdiction, uh, an overlay district uh, uh, over a redeveloping area, uh, negotiated development agreement or other method. And, and as I said, with some of the nimbyism, once you can you know, kind of identify where it's going and the most appropriate location, uh, what, what I saw a lot of cities uh, that we, uh, that I saw presentations on uh, out uh, in, in California, they're using more of the overlay district method to focus on uh, certain areas. And that also helps to quell the community because there are you know, areas that they think that we should not be providing this, this type of housing. So that was one way of them dealing with, with the public. And, and I will say, interestingly enough, uh, just, just a side note here with uh, accessory dwelling units, what a lot of the cities found that once they started doing the uh, trying to promote the accessory dwelling units, the house, the, the uh, properties that were actually uh, the first to come in and start uh, developing uh, more accessory dwelling units were actually the higher income properties. Uh, and there's a reason for that because of affordability, a lot of more moderate uh, uh, income people were not able to afford to add the accessory dwelling unit uh, to, to their site. And then they, you know, but there's some ideas also for that, but I'll, I'll reserve that for when we uh, talk about uh, accessory dwelling units. That's one of the other areas that we have to uh, address as part of the, the statute here. But most um, inclusionary zoning policies provide for flexibility in implementation. They may allow developers to build affordable units at a site other than the market rate development. So sometimes those units may not go at the actual site. They may go to, to another site, a receiving site, for instance, or they may accept fees or land donation in lieu of development of affordable units. So uh, some other uh, ways that it works is that they will allow developers to pay uh, money into, uh, you know, she talked about this uh, lockbox of, uh, you know, so it allows uh, developers to also pay money into uh, a fund where the local government can then later, uh, you know, uh, utilize those those dollars to, to uh, work with, uh, say, a, a private developer that's doing uh, affordable housing development. Inclusionary zoning programs provide incentives or benefits for the housing, for, for the housing developers. For instance, developers may be allowed to build more units on a given site than typically allowed. This is the way that we're typically approaching it to entice them into uh, providing the affordable housings. They may have the permitting process fast-tracked and or may have certain fees waived. So these are some of the uh, ways that local governments can kind of help to uh, bring the, the cost down. Uh, nationally, there's over 174,000 affordable homes that have been produced uh, with uh, inclusionary zoning. 
So it, it, it is a uh, method of process that's uh, kind of uh, taken off. Now, with regard to the state of Florida, I talked about you know what uh, you know California has been doing, but Florida also has um, an inclusionary uh, uh, zoning uh, in effect as well. And uh, in 2019, the Florida legislature passed House Bill 7103. Uh, this bill amended the state's inclusionary zoning statutes. Now, under the new state law, local governments must now fully offset all costs to a developer when those costs result from an inclusionary housing ordinance. So if, if we are going to look at uh, putting in place inclusionary zoning uh, within the city, then our uh, ordinance is going to have to offset the, the cost so that the developer providing uh, those units is not uh, bearing the, the cost of our enforcement of the, uh, of the um, affordable housing units. Uh, the Florida Housing uh, Coalition with its years of development expertise uh, uh, is, is assisting uh, many local governments uh, uh, that uh, need assistance in kind of developing uh, uh, there are ordinances for uh, affordable uh, or inclusionary zoning. House Bill 7103, uh, for example, uh, it, well, let me give an example of, of how it works. So if, the, if there's a 100 unit development and a 10% inclusionary requirement, the local government would need to fully offset all cost associated with the 10 required affordable units. So the 10% here, 10% of 100 is 10 units. So we would have to figure out how to offset the cost for the developer providing those 10 uh, units. Local governments can do so by providing incentives such as density or intensity bonuses. This is clearly uh, the most popular way of doing that, reducing or waiving fees or by granting other incentives. And there's a lot of you know, fees in terms of permitting fees, uh, you know, there are other fees, impact fees that they have to pay, which uh, can uh, add significantly to the, the cost of construction as well. Local governments can also uh, offset costs by granting an upzoning that raises the value of the developer's property. For example, if a local government rezones a parcel from an agricultural use to a residential use, the local government will have increased the value of the land. And, and, and thus increases what the developer can build on, on, on that site. Now the example of rezoning from a zoning category that only allows five units per acre to a zoning category that allows 30 units per acre, for example, will also increase the value of the land. So this increase in land value can be used in the calculation to fully offset those costs. So, um, so House Bill 7103, uh, those provisions are, are pretty much found uh, in Florida statute section 166.04151. And this is uh, basically uh, th that section of the statute. So that section of the statute, this states that notwithstanding any other provision of law, a municipality may adopt and maintain and effect any law ordinance, rule, or other measure that is adopted for the purpose of increasing the supply of affordable housing using land use mechanisms such as inclusionary, zone, inclusionary housing or linkage fee ordinances. Uh, an inclusionary housing ordinance may require a developer to provide a specified number or percentage of affordable housing units to be included in the development or allow a developer to contribute to a housing fund or other, alternative, or other alternatives in lieu of building the affordable housing units. An affordable housing linkage fee ordinance may require the payment of a flat or percentage-based fee, whether calculated on the basis of the number of approved dwelling units, the amount of approved square footage, or otherwise. So if you develop a linkage fee, you have to kind of develop uh, your, your method or manner of collecting uh, that fee. So in exchange for a developer fulfilling the requirements of uh, subsection two, uh, or for residential or mixed use residential development, the requirements of subsection three, a municipality must provide incentives to fully offset all costs to the developer of its affordable housing contribution or linkage fee. Such incentives may include, but are not limited to, allowing the developer density or intensity bonus incentives or more floor space than allowed under the current proposed future land use designation or zoning, reducing or waiving fees such as impact fees, as we talked about, or water sewer charges, or granting other incentives. 
Subsection two does not apply in an area of critical state concern as designated by the uh, statute section 380.0552 or chapter 28 through 36 Florida Administrative Code. Also, notwithstanding any other law or local ordinance or regulation to the contrary, the governing body of a municipality may approve the development of housing that is affordable as defined in uh, section 420. Uh, 0. 0.0004 on any parcel zone for residential, commercial, or industrial use. Now, these th this section 420.0004 uh, uh, kind of provides the, the definitions that we've kind of talked about a little bit. It gives an overall uh, definition of uh, affordable. Again, that 30% number that we that uh, Commissioner Rich talked about earlier, and then it kind of defines what extremely low income uh, is what low income uh, person means and what moderate income persons mean as well. And then very low income persons. Uh, you can see also that exceeds 50% and is very low income. So, uh, you know, Senator uh, or uh, uh, Commissioner Rich sort of went over that in, in great detail. So those are sort of the, the definitions. So as long as we're addressing that as part of the uh, inclusionary housing and we're providing housing for those uh, subsets there, we're, we're in pretty good shape. Um, so that's just an overview of uh, inclusionary zoning. And uh, as I said, it's a tool that uh, I think is, is very effective uh, in uh, addressing uh, affordable housing and probably something that uh, for this city, something that we'll have to, to take a very serious uh, look at. Um, putting in place if we're going to make a dent in uh, providing additional uh, dwelling units. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have uh, with regard to inclusionary zoning. But we, we Thank do. you, Mr. Holmes. Um, do we have any members of the committee who have questions? If you do, please speak up. Uh, this is Bruce. Yes. Thank are you at liberty to share with us I mean, there's a lot of building going on in plantations and stuff like that going on? Are you at liberty to share with us the incentives that the current builders have been given? Yeah, well, I can tell you that um, we, we haven't had many builders that have come in to uh, uh, request utilizing any of the provisions that are available uh, with, with, within the county. We do have one that uh, is currently uh, pending approval before the, the, the council. And as I said, the city does not have a policy in place where we actually mandate it. But uh, as Commissioner Rich said, that climate is, is changing for local governments. And as these projects come through, they're going to be, they're, they're getting a little, uh, um, you know, they're, they're asking them to, to kind of step up and, and, and do a little more. But we, we have one project that is actually uh, requesting uh, the use of um, uh, the, the provisions within the Broward County Land Use Plan, which, which is in incentive, uh, de bonus density based uh, provision. Right, right, not financial, right. Thank you. Do we have a Thank you. Any other uh, members of the committee that have questions for Mr. Holmes? All right. Dan, thank you very much. Thank you. And I don't know if we were doing the vacant land um, or. If you're ready to present, we'll go ahead and, and let you continue from there. OK. Okay, so um, as you know, one of the uh, requirements of, of this uh, committee is to kind of do an analysis of uh, vacant land uh, so that we can see what's available in terms of uh, the vacant land owned by the municipality that is kind of maybe a possibility to do uh, affordable housing on the I'm sorry. Yeah, that's that's me. <laughs> um, so we've conducted uh, our analysis. Um, now, the city owns thousands of parcels. Most of the parcels that the city owns are basically uh, a right of way 
parcels. So they're not going to be parcels that are even suitable for us to even begin to, uh, to, to look at. So what we did was we kind of parsed out those, those parcels that were right of way and we kind of identified uh, within the city those, those other parcels uh, uh, to just kind of go through and uh, be consistent with the statute to, to, to take a look at. So overall, we identified uh, 22 parcels um, that are owned by the city. So the, the first parcel here is uh, sort of an area that's part of a, a wetland area and, and uh, volunteer park. So, and, and you'll find that many of the parcels that we own are uh, some of them, many of them are park uh, parcels. So they're not going to be viable for us to really utilize for the development of, of affordable housing. So uh, the, the second parcel that we looked at, there was a very small parcel um, adjacent to the Jacaranda Lakes, uh, as you see here, um, which is very small parcel. Again, not, it's not a parcel that's going to be feasible uh, for us to consider uh, as a prospect for uh, development. Then there's a parcel adjacent to Mirror Lakes uh, Elementary. This is again, more of a, a parks related uh, parcel. So uh, again, not uh, feasible. The fourth parcel is adjacent to the city utility plant. Now this is, uh, this is a Sunrise Boulevard uh, here, Plantation High School, I think is a little north of, of here. Um, so the, uh, the, the city has utility um, right here, and the city also owns this parcel. And we get dozens of calls. I mean, since I've started here in 2016, I can't tell you how many calls I've fielded from developers calling and wanting to purchase this. But the utilities department has uh, identified this as a parcel that will probably be needed to uh, expand the utilities infrastructure in the future. So it's not really a, a parcel that's viable for us to, to take a look at. Then there's a parcel Liberty uh, Tree Park, of course, uh, again, a park uh, the, that the city owns. This parcel is located uh, off of Green, what was the, uh, 43rd uh, Avenue, yes, uh, you can see it here. It is, uh, it is a residential parcel. Um, give you a closer look at it here. Uh, so it's a, it's a small parcel, but you're not gonna, you know, get, you can maybe build a single family home there. You're not gonna get much density out of that. And plus you, you have to be cognizant of the surrounding uh, development there as well as a single family. And this is the seventh parcel, another parcel that's uh, in the vicinity of uh, single family uh, development located here. This is Northwest Third Court. I think we did a, a closer view of that as well. So you can see there, but you know, you can see the street here. Again, it's not a parcel that you're gonna get much, much density out of. Uh, this is the eighth parcel that we identified. This is, uh, located uh, in, on Northwest uh, 79th Avenue uh, at the entryway here. Again, not a, not a viable piece. This is a very small parcel that, that you see here. Uh, maybe you can build a tiny home there. Uh, <laughs> however, there's no access uh, to, to the parcel. So it's adjacent to the FPL substation as well. Um, this is uh, another um, parcel, North Hiatus Road. Um, you know, there, there could be some possibility here, but this is, it's still a very small parcel. Uh, so you won't get much in the way of any uh, significant uh, density there. Um, this is a parcel that's located at the uh, intersection of Brower Boulevard and uh, North State Road 7. This is the Wawa uh, that's located there. So this is a parcel that the, the city owns uh, here. This is uh, number 12. This is uh, 40, 41 East Tropical Way. Uh, so this is uh, in the east, eastern part of the city. But again, this is not really a, a viable uh, parcel for development as well. And then this is a park. Uh, with uh, This is uh, 595. And so there's a, a park parcel located at the very uh, southern part of the neighborhood here, I think at Terror. 
Terra Drive. Um, again, park parcel. This is another parcel, East Tropical Way, that's located uh, very close to the, to the golf course here. Uh, this is another parcel and, whoops, sorry, I think I hit. Another parcel uh, uh, around the golf course in Jacaranda that you, you see here, very small parcel. That's a closer uh, view of that parcel. And this is a parcel on Southwest, what's that, 13th Street? Uh, yeah, so yeah, so again, uh, near Plantation High, very, very uh, small parcel. And then this is a uh, one adjacent to the to that uh, parcel as well. Uh, Seventeen. This is approximately uh, one acre. This is a park uh, parcel uh, here as well. And then um, this is uh, around that Fifteenth Street. Uh, so there's a little parcel here, but again. Uh, Park-related uh, parcel, Seminole Park, approximately six acres. This is a parcel that uh, the city uh, owns in um, Plantation Acres area. Um, it was, you know, we've, we've received lots of inquiries for people wanting to develop single family uh, on this parcel. But again, it's a city-owned parcel. I think uh, this piece here was donated by Ann Cole, I believe, to the, to the city. And that's that's the little donut piece that I just spoke of. Um, and the parcel 20 is located uh, right here. Uh, again, very small parcel and the way it's positioned, it's not really a viable piece. You see a closer picture of it there. And this is the parcel that's uh, located uh, on 21st Court. Uh, this this was was this park parcel as well? I forget what the designation is. Plantation acres. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And then uh, this was a CRA. This is a property that the CRA owns along uh, Peters Road, and we're actually currently looking at this parcel for development of uh, of uh, affordable uh, housing on it. So we are actually. Uh, pursuing that on. So this was the one parcel that we were able to find that uh, we could probably do uh, something uh, on. But, you know, as I said, so we've gone through that inventory and, you know, so it's very small parcels here and there and they're not very viable parcels or they're either park parcels uh, that are part of the city's park inventory that uh, we uh, need as part of our comprehensive plan. Um, so that's the, our vacant uh, property analysis. So I don't know if there's any questions. Madam Chair, if I Yes, Edwin, go ahead. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, uh, we heard Commissioner Geller ex, um, presented to the city this idea that in order for affordable housing to work, it has to be close to a traffic area. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's not possible to, to consider that the problems with transportation will allow um, people that qualify for affordable housing to reside there. But on these properties that you just uh, mentioned, uh, well, uh, from this land that you just mentioned, is there anything that is close to uh, an area or, well, other than the one that is uh, about Brow, um, Wawa because <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's going to work. Right, yes. But well, that's probably the only one that, if, if, you know, in trying to locate it close to uh, transit. Hmm. Uh, but as you said, it's, it's not very feasible. Um, in, in my opinion, I think that probably the city is going to have to take a look at it. And this is very similar to the project that we have on Sunrise Boulevard, where you can begin to look at parcels that are located along major arterials where there are, and these are probably going to be more commercial uh, type parcels uh, where you can kind of do mixed use type development on a transit oriented development uh, type use on that's closer to, uh, 
you know, uh, bus routes or what have you, where uh, persons uh, would have access to uh, transit. Uh, so I, the, in my opinion, I think as we kind of work through this, we're going to be kind of identifying parcels that are going to be probably closer to some of the major arterials that are probably more commercially zoned as opposed to residentially zoned. Uh, if I may, uh, another question. Um, you, the last um, what, land that you show is uh, CRA in Peter's uh, Road. That uh, it's it's. Um, on the west side of the of 441, before you reach Peters, it used to be a pantry nursery mm -hmm. that is being leveled now. Yes. And it's huge. It's like yes. about, I will say, I, I, I'm not a, an engineer or architect, but I will think it's at least 20 times bigger than the one, this CRA. Is that a property that is private? Uh, it's private and it has an approved uh, plan for it. In fact, the reason it's being leveled is because they're they're in the process of developing the approved site plan, which is for uh, uh, assisted uh, senior living, basically. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from members of the committee? Yes, Maud Bruce. Yes, ma'am, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Holmes, the property at 8601 West Sunrise Boulevard, you know, I was at a commission meeting and I kept hearing a lot of uh, comments <laughs> about it. So I rode yes. over there. I mean, that is a large piece of property. Yes. And I said, wow, this would be great. Affordable housing here. And, the, you know, um, at today's summit, they said that uh, affordable housing was more or less a negative connotation. So they wanted us to say housing affordability. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, that, that's a long. Yeah, I, I've been, I've said affordable housing today, but I, I like to use the term either attainable or yeah. workforce I understand. Uh, uh, housing. But yeah, you're right. And that's one of the, the, the things that you have to be cognizant of um, because the a term affordable housing that conjures up what, what in people's minds, really, what we think of as public housing, exactly, and we project, think of these project, old, right, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. But I so. rode over to eighty six hundred one, and I was surprised how large that property is over there. Right. And I mean, there could be many buildings. I said, I wouldn't mind living here. Right. You know, that so. is huge. Over yeah, it's there. it's it's a big piece. Yes, um, it is. Can and, we consider that? I mean, what, what would it well, take? It's, well, it's, it's under consideration now. As I said, there is a developer. Uh, he's been approved uh, uh, by the Planning and Zoning Board, and it's uh, actually going to the commission um, next, yeah, next week. Oh, um, okay. So for, for consideration, and there is a component of that that would have a certain percentage of, uh, you know, affordable housing, uh, attainable housing, attainable. Uh, okay. <laughs> workforce housing, <laughs> what, what, if you would, um, as part of that. All right. Thanks. But it's, it's as we, yeah. as, as it's kind of moved along, it's, you know, again, I think some of it is, is educational and I think some of it could be the uh, amount of development that they they're putting on that parcel as well so I think there's kind of two things there that it's kind of garnered some uh, opposition along the way All right. thank you all right any other questions or comments from the committee members for the members of the public who are participating through Zoom. Are there any questions for Mr. Holmes? All right, Mr. Holmes, thank you very much. Yep, we have one person. Oh, we do, okay, I'm sorry. It's a little hard to, I can't see the, we have a attendee who is raising their hand. Yes. Nice. All right. Hey, can you guys hear me? All right. Hello? Yes, yes we can hear you, go ahead. Please okay, introduce you. yourself for the record. What was that? Please introduce yourself for the record. Uh, hi, my name is Max Goldstein. I'm a resident of Plantation. I would have loved to be there in person, but I'm on a little vacation, decided to tune in uh, virtually. Um, I, I just have a quick question, which is, we know that that housing, just like anything else, it's, it's a market, it's supply and demand based. And the reason that it's going up and up and up is because we don't have a supply of any homes, really. We have a very low vacancy rate. 
affordable housing is a component, but market rate housing, if we can build more of it, it would also lower prices as the market gets saturated. And the way that cities develop over time normally is that properties get redeveloped and increase in their density naturally over time. But we've zoned most of the city for single family. We've locked in a certain number of units and we're not allowing for most of the city to increase. And I know that people have attachments to single family housing and, and whatnot, and they're attached to the neighborhoods that they grew up in. But wouldn't it make sense to start opening up the city to, to do ADUs like Director Holmes was saying, or to increase with gentle density like duplexes, triplexes, to try to get that market rate housing into saturated? Because affordable housing is great, but we have, you know, from Steve Geller's previous presentation, we've got 14,000 people moving in yearly to Broward County, and we can't build 10,000 affordable homes every year to meet that demand. We need to increase market rate housing too. So I don't know, obviously inclusionary zoning is part of that, but shouldn't we look at starting to rezone and increase with gentle density, like larger tracts of land, not just vacant land? Um, I'll field that one through uh, Mr. Holmes's presentation earlier. I know it, it, there's, a, there's a lot of meat on that bill, uh, that House Bill 1339 that was passed in 2020. But when you mention rezoning, which for a lot of us means more costs, more delay, more of a, a process that adds you know, significant costs and delays in bringing those types of market units to um, the community, those options are now available to the city. So where you have a developer that identifies a need and would like to have additional density that's appropriate and they have the infrastructure, they don't have to go through that additional hurdle to rezone. So that does give planners and the council a lot more flexibility. And I believe that uh, we're already moving a uh, accessory dwelling unit ordinance through the council for planning and zoning. So that's something that is already underway that will again, open up more um, inventory as well. Uh, maybe uh, Mr. Holmes wants to continue on that or Mayor Stoner. Yeah. No, I, I, I think you put it uh, <laughs> succinctly. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Okay. All right, very good. Um, Mr. Goldstein, did you have a follow-up or did that help to answer part of your, your question? I, I think you covered it. it. It's really just that I, I don't see us reaching that supply capacity without allowing that density throughout the city instead of just, you know, spot rezoning at a time. I think it might need to be a neighborhood by neighborhood change. Understood, we appreciate your feedback. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have anybody else, a uh, member of the committee or the public who would like to speak? No. All right. Okay, I don't believe that we have anything else on the agenda for uh, Mr. Holmes. Did you have one more thing to add? I, I just wanted to do one other thing. Uh, I have, uh, we have a new member of our department that I just wanted to recognize who will be working with us in the future, Michael Alpert. He comes to us as the Assistant Director of Planning and Zoning. Uh, he arrives not a minute too late, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're just happy to have him. So I just wanted to to introduce him, you guys will be seeing him in the in the future. Okay. That's wonderful. Thank you very much and welcome. Okay. All right. Well, if no one else has any additional business, Edwin moves that we rise. Thank you very much for your time, and we will see you again in June. <laughs>